Good morning. Welcome, everybody. It's great to get to be together in, in God's presence as God's people, remind each other the truths of, of who God is, sing praise to Him. I, I love the song, Welcome You with Praise. We welcome you with praise. I often think of just what to pray for, even on a Sunday morning. And while my prayers cover a lot of things, I think at the end of those prayers, I come back to, God, this morning is not ultimately about like our needs and things working okay and, you know, all the pieces fitting together. God, this is your morning. We just want you to feel blessed by what happens over the course of these hours together as God's people worship and learn together. And so I love that song, how that draws us in. If you'd meet me in the scriptures in Psalm 15, that's where we're going to be today. Even as we turn our way there, um, we are welcoming back and praising God for the safe arrival of our youth missions team. They arrived late last night after like a 14-hour drive, and so, you know, despite a couple of adventures along the way, everybody's safe and sound, but thank you for your prayers, because we just had a sense that God was really in their midst, and just an amazing time of building community together, and we're just excited to keep hearing and processing their, their story. So thanks so much, thanks so much for your prayers. I want to read now Psalm 15, the word of the Lord, Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor and casts no slur on others, who despises a vile person, but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts, does not change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken." We join in praying with me as we continue to study God's word together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are here, um, Lord, in the midst of this service. We pray that the songs that we have lifted to you would have been a blessing to your heart, Lord. Let, let every heart adore, Lord. Let every soul awake. We lift, we lift our songs to you in worship. Lord, we also just bring before you, um, Lord, just the generosity of our hearts by way of offerings given throughout the course of the week. Some here, some online. Lord, we want to remember to just pray for those because that's part of our worship to you. We ask your blessing on those gifts, and we thank you, too, also for the faithfulness, generosity of, of your people, Lord. Now we come to you with the worship of our hearts by way of, of softness, invitation, opening so that as you speak, we will listen. Lord, it will be for our blessing, but ultimately we pray that it will bring a, 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 just a return to you as we're changed and then live lives that, that honor you as we trust you, as we serve you. And we know that Psalm 15 can have a huge impact in us through the power of your spirit. And in Jesus' name, we pray these things, Lord. Amen. As we begin to study here this morning, I want to ask, what place in your life, as you look back, was the safest of them all? When, as you look back on your life, was there a place where everything felt stable and secure, and all of the, the chaos of the world around you seemed to fade away? Everything in that place you knew was going to be okay. Maybe it was a, a lakeside cabin that you would go to on vacation with your family. Maybe it was grandma and grandpa's house when you would travel there for the holidays. Maybe it was the home that you grew up in, but you just knew that was a place of deep stability for you. You know, as I was reflecting on that question myself, I remember a time in my life that did not feel stable by way of what I was going through. It was right in between my freshman and my sophomore year of college. And just by way of processing my, my own faith and my own 
personhood. I just was experiencing a whole, whole lot of anxiety and inner turbulence. It was just an exhausting time for me. And so as I came into my sophomore year, I was going to be a part of the residence life program at the college that I was a part of. And one of the aspects to the training of that was just the evening barbecue, I think it was, at the home of the dean of students. And this was a, an amazing mentor, uh, an amazing person of God. And so I remember, though, entering into their house, and it was as if crossing the threshold just entered into a place of incredible peace and incredible stability. To this very day, as I look back on that, I think, wow, Lord, there must have even been something spiritual about that, just by way of blessing that we're in. I was there, just I felt protected and secure and safe, and in that time where I had been just going through so much, in those moments, I felt peace. And boy, I wanted to live there forever. I think we all know that sense of home and a sense of security. And I think more than we know, if we're honest, it's this desire, the quest for a place that's safe and secure that actually fuels like our entire existence. In a world where everything is like topsy-turvy and where it feels like the ground kind of falls out from underneath us, we're looking for places of security, We look for a ballast in our lives. We're looking for a stable place to dwell. And it's not that this stability is even just limited to being protected from dangers, whatever they may be. I think that some of this stability actually has to do with living a a productive and a fruitful life, a life that, that counts and isn't just up to the mercy of the tides of the things that we're going into. And so I think by way of describing this, you can see this whole picture of a life of a person who's stable. Again, this image of, of having kind of a, a ballast, security. But where can that be found? And I think it's this question, this quest that actually fuels so much of what David is talking about in this particular psalm. Yes, it does open with a significant question. We're going to come back to that in a moment. But what fuels the opening question that David has for us in verse 1? What fuels this is a quest that he's on. It's actually a quest that he wraps up with, the very last verse of Psalm 15. David says he's looking for a place wherein he, the reader, a person, will never be shaken. That's stability. That's that security that he's looking for. That's what David's after. I believe that he writes this psalm and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to help other people discover this. David's a normal guy like you and like me. And so he desires this stability in his life, but he sees all kinds of problems out there. He's got all kinds of dangers and all kinds of world forces that are just churning up around him. And so he feels far from stable in this world of lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, and with David, like they were like real lions and tigers and bears. And it's not just that the problems were out there. I mean, he looks inside and he also is like, man, I've got insecurities and anxieties and complexities and fears and doubts. And so often he feels internally not stable. He feels shaken. And so, can you see in David this quest? How can someone never be shaken? It's that quest that's fueling the whole psalm and indeed the question that he leads out with. Now, David's mature spiritually. He's been on a walk with God for a considerable amount of time. So for all of the questions that he has about where can I find stability and I'm looking for that, he has already settled a really significant aspect to that quest. And it's this, that finding ultimate stability comes only as he has ultimate community with God. He's looking for ultimate stability, but he's already settled on the fact that the only place that he knows he's going to find that ultimate stability is in ultimate community with God. And so he couples these two things together. One, where can I find and experience stability in life? 
I'm already settled. I know that that comes as I walk closely with God and indeed live in really close relationship with him. And you put those things together and you get verse one. You get verse one, which is this. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent and who may live on your holy mountain? God, if I'm gonna experience stability, it's gonna be in deep relationship with you. And so how can I live there? Who gets to live there? Because that's where I want to be. Now, what's this imagery that David is talking about? The tent, the holy mountain. Well, certainly he's drawn on a really deep well of Old Testament imagery, particularly as it relates to the covenant, the Levitical system, the tabernacle wherein God had given his people this this picture of a, of, a, of a tent and then they, they, they built it exactly to the, the coordinates that he gave and then this tent was placed in the middle of the encampment of all of his people as they were in the wilderness and God would meet them there and it's there that they would sacrifice to him and it was very much the, the middle, the center place of the covenant wherein they would live in relationship with the God of the covenant and David dwells on those things But even on a deeper level than just, I want to come and offer sacrifices and then go home, David has this hunger to say, if that's where a person is close with God and experiences him, I don't want to just go there on Saturday, on the Sabbath. I want to live there. Is there a way that I can actually camp out there? I also think that David's mind is coming is thinking about another another image that we have from the Old Testament. It's it's another tent that Exodus chapter 33, verse 11 describes to us. It was called the tent of meeting. And this was distinct from the tabernacle. And this was a tent that was actually outside of the camp wherein Moses would go to seek God as he had specific questions about how to lead the people. And it's amazing to read in Exodus 33 about this, but specifically is the description of the fellowship and the relationship that Moses had with God when he would go into this tent. So Exodus 33, 11 said, the Lord in this place would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks with a friend. That's a really beautiful description, isn't it, of this fellowship, this community that Moses experienced with God. So a lot of Old Testament imagery that David is drawing on here as he speaks about this, but we know one thing for sure, that to David, the greatest hope and hunger that he has in his life is to live in as close community and proximity with God as he possibly can. So this is not the only place in the Psalms that we have David saying, God, can I move in with you? Please, please adopt me. I want to live in your house. Psalm 27, verses four through six, David's saying, one thing I ask. He could ask God for a lot of things, but he says, God, I want one thing. I want to live in your house forever. Please, please. Psalm 84.10, better is one day in your courts than a thousand days elsewhere. God, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in your house. I'd rather be a servant in your house than to be VIP in the house of the wicked. And so we just see in David this hunger. You know, you and I bring a lot of questions to the Bible. Lord, what, what about this in life? I'm, I'm seeking guidance. Or what does this particular passage mean? And God is so gracious to answer those questions that we bring. But far more important are the questions that the Bible asks, and specifically the questions that the Bible asks of us. Because as we read these questions, the like that we have here in Psalm 15, verse 1, it helps us to ask, you know, am I consumed with the right questions in life? Or if I'm asking certain questions, some of the times God's word will reshape those questions because our questions can be off just a little bit. But as we read Psalm 15 verse 1, we have one of these incredibly important questions shared with us from David and we're listening to this and we want to first ask, you know what, am I hungry for the answer to this question in the same way that David is? Like is this one of the burning questions in my life If it's not, we want to make it one of these questions. Another side of this, we may read David's question and just say, you know what, that is weird, David. This just seems like so foreign 
impractical, like some religious camping trip. Listen, I'm super busy. I've got all kinds of other things going on in life. And so, yeah, I can read this on a Sunday morning, but I just have no connection or real interest in that particular question at all. Who can live and dwell with God? Now, we will say this. However we feel about this question, whether we hear it from David and say, you know what, that is a burning question in my life. I continually ask myself, God, how can I dwell ever closer in community with you? Or if I decide, you know what, I'm not so interested in that question. I got all other kinds of questions and quests that I'm on in life other than this kind of thing. Either way, we don't ever like opt out on the question of choosing to dwell and to live somewhere. And the decision that we make on that is probably going to be based on a desire for finding stability and security in life. And that pressure, because we all feel it every day, presses us one way or another. But we can be sure of this. If we choose to dwell elsewhere other than in deep fellowship with God, we've missed it. Because the only place to find ultimate stability is in ultimate community with God. So let's assume that we have the same hunger that David did and that we're, in a sense, waking up in the morning saying, God, who can live with you? Because that's the greatest hunger that I have and therefore, how can I live with you? What does Psalm 15 say to us about the person who's ready to dwell in God's presence? Well, first off, the person who's ready is the truly good person who is who they say they are. This is verse two. It says, those whose walk is blameless who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, this person, Psalm 15 says, is ready to dwell with God. This person loves God, and they show that they love God by choosing to do what what pleases him. There's an honesty in their heart. They're honest with, with God in the things that they tell him. They're honest with other people in what they share with them. And then I think there's an honesty of self wherein there's no pretenses. So this person doesn't just say the words, God, better is one day in your house than a thousand elsewhere when their heart doesn't mean it. This person would only ever say that if they really meant it because there's a true integrity in their hearts. This is the person that Psalm 15 says is ready. According to Psalm 15, the one ready to dwell with God is the truly good person who's good to others, especially with their words. Look at verse 3. The person whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor, and casts no slur on others. We don't want to ever miss how closely connected our treatment of others is with the communion that we experience with God. Jesus was asked in the New Testament, what's the greatest commandment, Jesus? Can you, can you sum up the whole law in just a, just a phrase? And he says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Those things intricately connected. And again, here, the words. The words, as James reminds us, that are so hard to control. Who's tamed the tongue? Like nobody, right? And yet the person who's ready to live in God's presence is someone who treats other people well with their words. According to Psalm 15, the person ready to dwell with God is the truly good person whose allegiances are clear. The persons whose allegiances are clear. Verse 4, who despises a vile person but honors those who fear the Lord. Humans like you and me, we're often attracted to people who can provide to us some benefit. And a lot of times it relates to the whole question and the quest and the search we have for stability, for ballast in this world. And so a lot of times we're drawn to people who are going to present to us some kind of advantage on that level, which is not all bad to say, to say the least, but certainly there are many times that we sell our souls to the devil literally by way of allying ourselves with people whose hearts are far from God, who operate in ways that don't please him, and yet we say, I know, but I I need protection, I need security, I'll I'll just ally myself with them, that's the only way to get through life. And then on the other hand, we reject amazing, humble people who love God because, well, we just don't really see how they benefit us and advance 
our cause, but not so the person who's ready to dwell with God. This person says that the vile person who rejects God, that's, that's not my person. I'm not going to put my hope in them. But you know what? I will honor, I will honor anybody who truly fears the Lord. And then in this list, according to Psalm 15, the one who's ready to dwell with God is the truly good person who's okay taking the hit and who resists taking easy advantage of other people. Verses four and five say, this person keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind. This person lends money to the poor without interest and they do not accept a bribe against the innocent. We live in a low commitment culture wherein people are incredibly quick to change commitments because you know what? It no longer works for me. My, my life changed since I promised you that I was going to do such and such. And so just with a quick message, I'm going to let you know, sorry, not going to fulfill my commitment. People are also ready to glean from the unsuspecting, from anybody weaker than them or that they can somehow take advantage of. And you know what? It's just a dog-eat-dog -dog world. It's the way that things go. That's just business. Put whatever language you will on it. But the person who's ready to dwell with God doesn't live that way. They keep their commitments even when they realize that it's no longer to their advantage. And even when they see a way that they can make a, a, a quick a quick interest on someone, they say, no, I, that's not me. I don't take advantage of people. This is the person who's ready to dwell in the tent of the Lord and to live on his holy mountain. It's really a remarkable list. It's a high calling. And in fact, as we kind of step back and look at it, it actually becomes just an amazing privilege and invitation to experience stability the likes that we've never found anywhere else, even as it invites us to experience deep and ultimate community with God. How so? Well, these are the ways that this passage and this psalm invites us to experience stability. First, it invites us to experience stability in our understanding of who God is, in our basic understanding of who God is. You know, the longer you get to know someone, the more you understand their, their likes and their dislikes and their priorities and their values. This psalm provides to us a picture of God, what he values and who he is. This is a God of, of holiness and of purity who loves good, who cherishes honesty, who takes great delight when humans treat each other well and honor each other in the way that he would desire for them to be honored as his creatures. One of the things we need to not forget is that picture of God that we have here is not the kind of deity that most people in history, and certainly in our world today, have, have, have served. If we look back in the Old Testament, there were all kinds of idols and lesser deities that God's people, the Israelites, were tempted to serve in the land of Canaan. One of them that's prominent is Moloch. And you read on a number of occasions that Moloch was a very dark and evil deity. And one of the sacrifices that he asked of people was that they would sacrifice in the fire their own babies and their own children. This evil it's horrible. It's demonic. But if you went to the Canaanites and said, who is God to you? They would say, well, we worship the deity Moloch. And you would say, I grieve for you that that is who you know God to be. Friends, not so for us who know the God of the Bible as he reveals himself in the scriptures. Who is the God that you and I love and serve and who we desire to dwell with? He's a God of goodness and purity, and love, and care for other people. So this is an invitation to a, a stability in the fact that we know who God is, and he's amazing. He's amazing. This passage is also an invitation to stability in the way that it teaches us and reveals to us ultimately how we can enter in and dwell with him 
and experience deep community with him. We can cut to the chase by way of our time this morning by saying, look, as we read this and we say, these are the qualifications of the people who are ready to live with God, like our first response needs to be, oh boy, that's not me. That is not me. And I could never be that in a million years as hard as I try. Amazingly, in Psalm 14, literally like just verses before this, we have verses two and three of Psalm 14. The Lord looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there's any who understand, any who seek God. And what's the answer to that question? All have turned away. All have become corrupt. There's no one who does good, not even one. So the first three through this psalm is actually one of desperation. I need to live in deep community with God if I'm ever gonna have the deep stability in life that I'm looking for. And yet what this describes by way of how you're ready to enter in and experience community with him, I don't have that. I can't produce that. Therefore, where should I go? But a second read through helps us to begin to understand, well, maybe this psalm isn't talking about me in as much as it's actually directing my attention to someone else. And indeed it is. It's directing our attention, as does so many of the other psalms, not so much to look at ourselves, but to look at the king and the one who will come that was all of these things. And through his own obedience and perfect life, dwelled in the presence of his heavenly father. We're talking about God's son, his perfect holy son, Jesus. And then the rest of the scriptures goes on to speak to us the wonderful and the great news that Jesus didn't enter into the very tents of God just to experience that blessing himself. He did that to experience the joy of inviting others to join with him. And so that's where the psalm starts to be incredibly hopeful and incredibly beautiful because we're not left with any sense of desperation that, oh, I will never be able to enter in. We're left with a sense of, wow, Jesus did enter in in all of his perfections, in all of his holiness. And now he is the God who says, come in with me. I'll wash you clean of your sins. I'll clothe you with my righteousness. And everything that I get to experience in the presence of God, you get to experience as well as a gift of grace. So let's celebrate in God's tent together. That is incredibly good news. That's wonderful news. And now all of these, these, these uh, teachings, these guidance of, of what it looks like for a person who really lives with God, it's not that these just get thrown to the side because now we're, you know, we're in, these things don't matter anymore. Not at all. If we allow God to change us, to recreate us into the image of Jesus, which this is exactly what we're seeing here, our lives are given a whole nother level of stability The stability that we have is we see who God is. The stability that we have because we're living in the presence of God through the sacrifice of Jesus. But now he actually teaches us how to live in a really stable way. When we walk through life fulfilling our commitments, caring for other people, speaking well of other people, friends, that's the way to live. That's the way to live. It feels better to live that way We know what right and wrong is. And in this world that celebrates what's wrong as being right, in this world that condemns what's right as being wrong, here we are, God shaping his own character in us, and it provides to us stability, stable ground. As we live this way because we're letting God change our lives in Jesus, we are not shaken. And all of this, this ultimate stability coming as we experience ultimate community with God, as we literally live and dwell in his presence. Now, I don't want us to allow wonderful truth like this to remain in any way disconnected from our real practical lives. So in our last few minutes, I want to pursue some practical steps, some exercises that I pray it'll be helpful 
And I pray that you might take these, maybe jot a little note, and as you go through your week, or maybe in a devotion or a prayer time, these are some things that you can do to say, how can Psalm 15 not just be kind of a foreign idea to me, but how can it be something real where it helps me to grow as God's word takes root in my heart? Here's the first exercise that I'd encourage you to take. I want you to write down your spiritual address. I want you to write down your spiritual address. If I asked each and every one of you right now, what's your home address, you'd be able to rattle it off right away, right? At least if you've had your coffee this morning. You'd be able to say, I know at least my physical address and where I live, but where are you living right now spiritually? Even in this ultimate quest that you and I have to find stability in this world that feels so many times like it's upside down. If someone asks you this question, what's your spiritual address, would you immediately write down, I live in the tent of the Lord. I live in God's house. I'm standing on his holy mountain. Or, or would you say, I have no idea what you're talking about. What do you, what do you mean, where am I living spiritually? Look, I answered those questions just on my own. I'm, I'm seeking financial security. I'm seeking relational stability. Those are the places that I'm finding what I'm looking for. Have you ultimately entered into community with God by faith in Christ? Have you answered that question? And then if yes, is your existence and your hope and your stability really and truly there? I pray that you and I can each get to a place in our, in our lives where on Monday or on Tuesday or on Thursday that we really don't look at a question like David's asking in Psalm 15 verse 1 and think, that's a really weird question, David. I pray that we would get to a place in our walk with the Lord and even with the scriptures that we're actually awakening in the morning with these thoughts of like, God, how can I live as close to you today as I possibly can? The closer that we walk with Jesus, the more that the Holy Spirit just starts to birth those things into us. Those are the questions that consume us as opposed to, you know what, how can I get further along in my career? How can I get that thing which I want, you know, into my hands? And please hear me, it's not that goals in life and things like that don't, don't matter, but, but if they're not secondary to a, a deeper desire, God, today, how can I walk as closely with you as my creator as I possibly can? then we've missed it. So what's your spiritual address? But the second, the second exercise is this. Double check your address. <laughs> All right? Double check your address. Um, have you ever like written down the address <clears throat> or the phone number and then you like, got one number off? That has an impact, doesn't it? In your GPS when you punch that in or whatever. It, it matters. So double check your address. This is that honesty that, that we're talking about that we are really who we say that we are. Now, how do we double check our address? Well, this text makes it really clear. Test our honesty by asking about the way that we treat people and even the way that we speak about people, the way that we treat our commitments. Are we a person who's willing to take the hit and not take advantage of people? I love that the scripture continually says, look at the fruit in your life. Not by way of, hey, are you doing enough good deeds to get into God's house? That's not the way that this works. Get into God's house through Jesus, and that's, that's it. But then once we are in the house, we're able to say, God, are you changing my life? Are you shaping me into your image? And we ask questions about the fruit, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Are those the things that we're seeing? Those will be indicators that we are thriving in God's presence. And one of the ultimate tests is, are we loving people sacrificially? Can I not say that thing that just feels like it's going to feel so good to say? Because that would just be to, to not love that person, to spread gossip, to spread slander. I really don't want to fulfill my commitment to that person. I realized after I told him that I would do that, that that's going to be incredibly inconvenient to me, both by way of time and financial output. 
but you know what? God's been so faithful to me. I need to really fulfill my commitment. Those kind of really practical shoe leather things are good indicators to us that God's alive in us through his Holy Spirit. That's the way we can double check our address. And then last, help someone else experience stability. Help someone else experience stability. We, in and of ourselves, are not the only ones who feel shaken in this world. Everybody that you run into is experiencing anxiety and, and fears and, and doubts and all kinds of troubles just as much as you are. And one of the opportunities for God's people is to say, you know what, I know where I live. I found my resting place. And so now, even though I'm still going through my own stuff, I have the opportunity to reach out to someone else and say, you know what, I can see that you're wrestling with, with some things. I'd like to invite you home. Come home. Come live in the stability that comes through a relationship with Jesus. Come with me. In fact, one of the best ways to answer our own anxieties and fears is actually to help somebody else. God cares about the things that we're going through, but sometimes maybe we give too much attention to them to the point that we just get self-obsessed and consumed. And one of the greatest gifts that God gives to us is the opportunity to serve other people and say, you know what? Let me help you. Care for you. As we conclude this morning, I just want to ask a couple of closing questions here. Are you looking for ultimate stability in life? A place wherein you will not be shaken? I know you are. (laughs) Because I know that's what I'm looking for. I really believe that this is an ultimate question of life. Another question, are you hungry to answer the same question that David does? Or maybe, maybe a better way to put it is, are you hungry to answer it in the same way that David does? As you're looking for ultimate stability, are you convinced that that's only going to come as you walk closely with God? And so are you asking the question every day, God, how can I live deeper in your presence even than I felt yesterday? Another question. Do you know that Jesus is the one who brings us into, ushers us into this community? That like he's our our one and only hope that we're holding on to to continually and daily experience this community? These are important questions. I encourage you to dwell on these, to pray over these. And if at any point you find yourself living at an address other than than Psalm 15, verse 1, a spiritual address other than what's described here. It's time to move. 